Good morning from Washington, D.C. My name is uh, Dr. Anwar Buhars, and I am a professor uh, of counterterrorism and counter violent extremism uh, here at the Africa Center uh, for Strategic Studies. And I want to extend a very uh, warm welcome to the many Africa Center uh, alumni, and distinguished colleagues and friends who have joined us today for this webinar. Uh, on understanding the origins of violent extremism in northern Mozambique's uh, Capo Delgado. Uh, we're pleased to partner uh, uh, with the African Center for the uh, uh, study and research on terrorism, uh, tired for this event. Now I'd like to pass it over to our director, Kate Anquesma, to say a few words about the African Center for Strategic Studies. Kate, please. Well, thank you, Anwar, and uh, good day uh, to all of our colleagues uh, who are joining us, uh, uh, whether you're alumni of the Africa Center, uh, friends, uh, uh, distinguished colleagues. We're really delighted to, uh, to have uh, so many uh, from across the continent, uh, from Europe and the United States uh, for this important topic. Um, and I'm delighted once again that we are partnering uh, with the African Union's Kyrt. Uh, so thank you to Idris Lalali and his colleagues, uh, and uh, we continue to appreciate uh, uh, this partnership very, very much. Uh, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies serves as a forum for research, for academic programs, and for the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a U.S. Department of Defense regional center located at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. And we carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. So accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security challenges and uh, trends, uh, and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. And recognizing that addressing uh, 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 such serious issues can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. And by engaging together, all of us, uh, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, national, regional, and international partners, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. In this kind of dialogue, we believe infused with real world experiences and fresh analysis such as we'll hear today, uh, we hope provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. And so thank you once again for joining us uh, uh, for this uh, important uh, discussion uh, on what is uh, happening in Mozambique and Cabo Delgado. Uh, thank you to our panelists in advance uh, for bringing us your expertise. Uh, and finally, thank you once again uh, to Kayert uh, and uh, Idris Lali and his team for partnering together with us. Back to you, Anwar. Thank you, Kate. And now let's begin um, our, uh, our webinar <clears throat> on understanding the origins of violent extremism in Capo Delgado. And we have three distinguished panelists um, and, uh, and one discussant, uh, uh, Idris Laleli, that will help us explore the causes, <coughs> the origins and nature of violent extremism um, in, uh, in northern Mozambique. So the security situation, as you know, in Mozambique's northern Cap, uh, Capo Delgado province has deteriorated at, um, at an alarming rate, um, endangering and uh, forcibly uh, displacing hundreds of thousands of people and threatening billions of dollars in, in foreign direct investments. Um, since October 2017, when a uh, Islamic State linked uh, armed group, Al Sunnah al Jamaa, uh, known locally as uh, the Shabab, <clears throat> attacked police stations in Mosamboa uh, de Praia, more than 1,300 civilians have been massacred and over half a million uh, civilians or one quarter of the local population of Capo Delgado province were displaced. Uh, about 250,000 of them uh, are children. So the trajectory of civilian devastation resembles what has unfolded in, in other theaters, in Sahel and the Chad Basin, even if the patterns obviously of violence remain distinct to Northern <coughs> Mozambique. 
So we're in a situation where communities are, are trapped between you know, violent extremists who have expanded their geographical bounds, uh, the geographical bounds of their attacks and operations. And then you have government security forces, you know, allied uh, mercenaries and, and other forces whose reported heavy handed security responses uh, have exacerbated the plight of, of civilians. And the recent deployment of Rwandan soldiers and police to Capo Delgado add yet uh, another fighting force in the mix. So it's not yet clear how these forces will operate in a uh, violent multi-actor system uh, marked by high intergroup antagonisms and, and fulfill their state mission of restoring Mozambican uh, state authority. Uh, but as experience of the Sahel and Somalia, it is do not get any better, obviously, just by deploying regional and international forces. So the bottom line is that the trend lines are, 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 are troubling. And unless state and regional authorities, as well as international actors, you know, accurately understand uh, the origins of an ongoing uh, political economy that have made this region vulnerable to destabilization, uh, efforts to, to counter it are not likely to succeed. Um, and our uh, three panelists and, and discussants will provide clarity uh, of the structural causes, the drivers, and the dynamics uh, underpinning violent extremism in, in northern Mozambique, particularly Capo Delgado. They will help us better understand the local grievances, um, the dynamics specifically that enable a violent extremist group to emerge. And then how has the you know, political economy, obviously, of the region exacerbated uh, or fueled these grievances? Uh, so we are uh, uh, you know, privileged to have uh, Mr. Dino Mahtani uh, with us today and he joined Crisis Group as Africa Program Deputy Director in July 2019. He assists uh, in developing the research ag agenda and shaping the analysis and reporting across the Africa Program as well as contributing to specific uh, research across the various projects. And Dino started his career as a journalist for, for Reuters, uh, working on the Democratic Republic of Congo and Nigeria. And he subsequently reported as uh, uh, correspondent and then uh, as energy correspondent for the Financial Times. And then we have Professor Adriano um, Alfredo uh, Novonga, uh, and he's a scholar and leading civil society activist in, in Mozambique. He's the director of the Center for Democracy and Development, a public interest nonprofit civil society organization contributing to the building of resilient, inclusive, uh, democratic, um, you know, uh, that, and, and that respects Mozambican society. And until May 2018, Professor Novonga led the Center for Public Integrity. It's a reputable anti-corruption civil society organization in Mozambique. Uh, Professor Novonga teaches political science and governance at uh, Mont Blanc University in Maputo, Mozambique. Then we have uh, Jasmine uh, Opperman. I understand she is having some technical problems, so we're hoping that uh, she joins um, as soon as, as possible. Um, and Ms. Jasmine Opperman is an expert in methodological risk analysis and the management of intelligence processes, operations, counterintelligence, covert activities, and analysis. Uh, she's a qualified uh, she, uh, as a risk analyst and holds a master's degree in history at the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. And her aptitude emanates from 19 years employment in foreign intelligence strategies. And then we have our discussant, uh, Mr. Idris uh, uh, Laleli, who's the deputy director, uh, sorry, he's the acting director uh, and concurrently head of uh, alert and prevention units at the African Center uh, for the study and the research on terrorism. And is a member of the multidisciplinary team designated by the EU to launch the, the center. And among his primary responsibilities are leading the design and development of the center counterterrorism early warning system, uh, managing a team of analysts that conduct policy analysis, studies, synthesis, and audits on terrorism uh, in Africa. And Mr. Lalali is also leading a team of experts that evaluate counterterrorism capacity uh, of African Union member states. Uh, so we'll go ahead and, and, and start with, uh, with Dino. Uh, uh, Dino, 
Sunnah wal Jama'a, or as it is known locally, Shabab, uh, first emerged as an armed group. It's my understanding in October 2017 when it attacked uh, three police stations in, in Mustambua, the prayer, to free detained members of, of, of the group. Yet, not much is, is known about, about the group, you know, strategic objectives, uh, whose domestic and international support they rely on. So can you please, you know, just start off with discussing the overall initiation and, and evolution of, of Ahl Sunnah uh, with Jamaa? You know? <clears throat> Thanks for the floor. Um, and apologies for any background noise. I have some construction right above me. Um, but um, yes, to, to, to look at the initiation and evolution of this group. You mentioned 2017, of course, that's the date that's referred to as the, the initiation of the armed conflict itself when the first shots were fired in Musimboy, the prior town. Uh, uh, having said that, the, 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 the phenomenon of Al-Shabaab, I won't call them Al-Sunnah wal Jamaa because actually, I mean, that, that is a, a, a nomenclature for the... Uh, which means the, the community of the devout. And it was something of a slang name uh, that, that, that was used and then faded out over time. The population refer to them as Al-Shabaab, which is really the youth. Um, and, and, and that also in a way um, uh, sort of um, uh, speaks to the, the, this group's very amorphous, uh, undefined nature, which I'll come on to in a second. But going back to the initiation of, of this, um, it, the reports of the, the stirrings of this go back to as far as far back as 2010 and perhaps even before then, when there were in, in, in the districts, in remote districts in the interior of, of, of Cabo Delgado, particularly in the southern districts, uh, in the Makwa heartland, the ethnic Makwa heartland, there were reports of uh, local youth uh, starting to uh, uh, show themselves as, as or dress as Islamists, uh, to try and block the enrollment of women into school, uh, um, force alcohol bans, and, and this sort of thing. Um, and over time, this started spreading um, throughout the different, different districts. Um, we, we note in our report that actually, without, without making this into an ethnic conflict, which of course it's not, uh, the, the, the provenance of many of the, the militants. It's, they don't exclusively come from these two communities, but they come from the Makwa com community predominantly, uh, the biggest community, the biggest ethnic community in Mozambique, and then also the Mwani, uh, a, 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 a minority uh, community on the coastal um, districts of, 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 of Cabo Delgado, who over decades since liberation from colonial occupation and then uh, during the post-liberation years have felt um, excluded from the political economy of, of Cabo Delgado, its riches, but also the illicit, you know, the illicit economy, which has been uh, taken over by many of the um, powerful uh, uh, political caucuses in, in, that, uh, in that province. And over time, what we what we then saw uh, uh, coinciding also with the return of a number of students who'd been sent abroad for religious instruction. Uh, and then when they came back uh, around this time frame, the, 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 there was almost a perfect storm of, of socioeconomic grievances, of uh, ethnic asymmetric, asymmetries, uh, of religious indoctrination starting to take root in, uh, in the way that uh, uh, finally permeated the, this group and gave it a religious flavor. Uh, and then of course, um, uh, many, of the, many of the young men also uh, that, that, that were drawn into this are, uh, and it's important to, to look at the, the, uh, the, the, the demography of the people who have come into this group. We're not necessarily talking about starving young men. Cabo Delgado is of course poor, but it's not as, uh, in some respects, it's not as uh, troubled on human development indicators as, 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 as even neighboring provinces, uh, for example, Zambezia or, or, or Nyasa. But what's particular about Cabo Delgado is the sense of exclusion from the formal economy, the illicit economy, uh, and then you had boys who were on the margin, boys or young men, I should say, on the fringes of of that of, of society struggling to hustle 
their way into these economic sectors. But you know, these are young men who who had some amount of a small amount of money in their pocket, enough for that to be taken away from them by at a, at, at a security force checkpoints. At the end of the day, uh, their, their fishing catches may be taxed, uh, and that boiling frustration, which was then made worse around the time of the mass expulsion of uh, artisanal miners from the ruby mines, in turn owned and, and, and occupied by uh, oligarchical forces um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the provinces of the political economy, then blew more oxygen into this resentment. And of course, as the, as the natural gas was developed uh, and signs, there was every signs that Cabo Delgado would become not just the, I mean, the, the economic, uh, 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 basis for the for the for the development of the state itself. Many of these young boys who who felt that their their futures perhaps were being denied them uh, uh, chose began to cho choose the way of the gun. And of course, these are young men, as I said, who who also had co access to the coastal uh, smuggling economy, uh, to to ways of acquiring weapons. Um, and then. Uh, I guess the last thing I should say, you know, around the time of 2017, there was also maybe we'll come to this much later later in the in the webinar today, but there was also a regional aspect uh, um, that was brewing at the same time. And 2017 was a watershed moment for for many armed groups in in the region, crackdowns in neighboring countries, particularly in Tanzania, for example, which forced a number of uh, Tanzanian. Uh, more heavily indoctrinated jihadis into into play in Cabo Delgado, uh, and and that has become uh, something of a a major factor as well. I would say in 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 the conduct and and unfolding of this crisis, which, as we'll perhaps talk about later on, now looks to also have major impact on regional uh, peace and stability. Thank you, Dino. Um, and indeed, the genesis of the insurgency, <clears throat> as you you, uh, uh, you just stated, and it stems from <clears throat> either 2010 or, or, or 2007, uh, when frustrated youth, mainly from the Makua ethnic group, uh, began denouncing the authority of local religious leaders, and, and their activism at the time had a, uh, as you mentioned, and you also in your report, uh, the Islamist sort of uh, tinge as they pushed for alcohol bans and, you know, uh, et cetera. But, but they also decried, uh, you know, the perceived or the economic exclusion uh, and made the discovery of that vast <clears throat> uh, deposits of rubies and uh, offshore natural gas on top of the So, uh, you know, as, as, as you rightly stated, and again, you, you wrote in that report, it's no coincidence that uh, uh, the, the militants, um, uh, you know, shifted to armed revolt in October 2017, a few months after that incident talked about, when the authorities expelled the uh, artisanal miners, including Mozambicans and Tanzanians from mining concessions. And then there is that regional component of what was unfolding at the same time in, uh, in neighboring Tanzania. So, so thank you very much. And now I'll turn to, uh, to Professor Adriano. Uh, there are still gaps in our understanding of the community dynamics that facilitated, uh, you know, the group coming about. Uh, so, Professor, if you can go deeper, you know, on the on the local grievances um, and the dynamics specifically that that enabled, uh, you know, this group uh, uh, that is referred to locally as a Shabab to emerge. Thank you, thank you very much. Good morning, good, good afternoon. Morning. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we do. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I will speak in Portuguese um, for 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 more clarity. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, pois, uh, concordo com. Uh, so I agree uh, with the points that uh, Dino uh, talked about. I am going to elaborate a little bit more about the uh, dynamics of the communities. The first aspect that I would like to underscore is that all this region by, uh, of the coast 
is predominant, predominantly um, Renamo held. And because the Renamo group, uh, which is the opposition, is present there predominantly, it leads to a marginalization of the Mozambican democracy. So uh, it led to the um, Mozambican government not to provide services and be present in uh, this area by the coast. And as we <coughs> saw, uh, it, um, uh, it has um, many groups of traders and other groups that did not participate in the liberation struggle. And therefore they have always been marginal marginalized and did not uh, benefit from the government. Uh, and the democracy that has been in existence for 20 years continued with the same pattern. The government, the state was not present in this region. Just to give you an example, in Musimboa da Praia, the first school, uh, high school in Mozambique yeah, da Praia, Mozimboa da Praia, uh, when the ex violent extremists occupied the ports and now with the, uh, se se the intervention of several um, uh, forces, it was liberated, but only in 2006, the first school, high school in Mosimboa da Praia was built human rights and the right to development to start with the right to education has always been uh, denied. And this made the youth in this region be in a situation of exclusion and vulnerability, vulnerable uh, to any kind of recruitment uh, that was available uh, in across the region. In the first place, the, the state was absent. And uh, we talked about education and schools, but the madrasas occupied a very important space in all this region. However, before, approximately 30 years ago, the first case of drugs, the first drug case in Mozambique was found in Kionda, 12 tons of hashish found in Kionda because uh, an accident happened and where that's because there was an accident. If um, we didn't have that accident, we would not know how many cases like this, drug cases uh, took place when the budget was cut. Hashish was the main uh, rev revenue source in Mozambique. 100 million of the 600 million generated uh, will be you were used to pay expenses in Mozambique. All the uh, corridor that uh, goes up to Montepuez became a, a trade zone. Uh, it, it, it intercepts the drugs and as well as the illicit economy linked to uh, natural resources, 
from artisanal uh, mining and uh, that artisanal mining was illegal. Uh, so this was the modus operandi. When the elites s started to uh, run the uh, use of the um, the youth, uh, young um, men that were working in those mines, they came from different parts of uh, uh, Africa, but they were expelled and pushed um, off to the border. This generated the first wave of radicalization, a wave of radicalized uh, uh, youth. They were uh, available and uh, they had lost uh, their livelihoods and so they became radicalized. However, they did not start to attack people or uh, property. They were just uh, trading in uh, the illicit economy. In 2005, in Mocinga da Praia, in that city, there were three days of violence that involved Muslims and non-Muslims. And what caused this was the municipal elections that were behind the conflict. This conflict um, involved, there was a, a lot of tumult over the course of these three days. But in spite of this problem that was always there, this did not result in, uh, in youngsters taking arms against the police. This tells us that the youngsters were there, the young people were there, the uh, problems were there, latent, and these problems are of a religious nature and ethnic nature. And also, they have a character in terms of access to services from the state. These problems were always there in a latent way. And the social fabric all of these factors led to violence, to the conflict as we see it, because elites, a number of elite groups, which competed one with the other, started to provoke the gen, instrumentalize the young people. And they led the way to invite people who are of a more terrorist bent to lead these operations. But the problems are local problems. The entire uh, social fabric that's conducive to the conflict is linked to local problems. When we look to the, the barbarity, the assassinations, the murders, people, the beheadings, the massacres, we can say that the um, gra gravity of this violence does not correspond to the social conflicts that were already existent there. We're seeing now uh, a dimension, another dimension, whereby terrorist met methods are being exported to Cabo Delgado. But we have to look at the foundations of this problem in uh, local uh, aspects. And remember that the state wasn't there, wasn't present. 
because the area belongs to the opposition and the state wasn't there to invest. But there are dimensions in terms of organized prime, which intersect the state, which compete among themselves. And many of these, as we see it, invited these leaderships, which came to lead the extremist operations in Mozambique using uh, terrorism, using terror in the north in Cabo Delgado. And I'll leave it there for us to go ahead with, with more. Thank you, uh, Adriano. Uh, I mean, you, you nicely unpacked how the socio-economic you know, marginalization and, and, and resource-rich Cabo Delgado bred grievances <clears throat> that drove recruitment into this, uh, this militant group. You also touched on, on political economy, uh, <clears throat> you know, because uh, the, ins the insurgency or violent extremism in, in, in Campo Delgado has been linked to, to this marginalization, but also <clears throat> to what you described as a large dynamic uh, illicit uh, uh, economy in, in, in the region. So it was interesting to see how political economy uh, exacerbates and, <clears throat> and fuel uh, uh, the grievances of the illicit economy, you know, compounded community grievances <clears throat> and generated the conditions, obviously, for, uh, for the group to, uh, to grow and, and, uh, uh, and, and thrive. So I'll, I'll go now to around to, to Dino <clears throat> on, um, on Shabab again. Uh, I mean, the, the publicly available uh, information uh, we have on the exact nature of the relationship between, you know, uh, or, or Shabab and the so-called Islamic State is limited. And in your report, the crisis group report, I mean, you state that, you know, the conflict in Capo Delgado has already been significantly affected by the proliferation of violent extremist networks, you know, in Tanzania. Uh, and, 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 and you show how over the last decade, you know, uh, violent extremists in Mozambique's neighbor have come into confrontation with security forces there. So, so the question, you know, is uh, how meaningful um, are the group's foreign connections and affiliations and ongoing recruitment, obviously. And, and what are the, the dangers if there are any, obviously, of overstating, um, attributing these, you know, regional uh, and global uh, violent extremist relationships. So, you know. Thanks. So this is a uh, a very complicated uh, uh, dimension to the, to the story. Um, I mean, uh, in a nutshell, what we are seeing now is. Uh, um, Th th through greater well, th there is greater visibility now of of the connections between uh, the insurgents in Cabo Delgado and the outside world. Um, also, because I think the amount of attention that has now started to come uh, on Cabo Delgado since you know since the Palma attack, um, and so through you know more heavy investigation and, and research by different parties, we're starting to see more of a connection to. Uh, the, 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 the likes of, of Islamic State. But let me just go back uh, uh, to the beginning. Um, this, the way that we have characterized this, this rebellion or this, this insurgency in, in, uh, in, 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 Moza, in, in Cabo Delgado, and as, as uh, Dr. Adriano rightly said, I mean, it's a very important point to, to, to make clear that uh, the local constituencies in Mosimboya de Praia are, are principally Renamo. I mean, the Mwani, the ethnic Mwani, principally Renamo. So there is this sort of uh, political coloration to the crisis. And that, that this is really a Mozambican affair, first and foremost. Um, the rank and file and the majority of fighters are Mozambican. These are young men who are angry. Now, a good proportion of the senior leaders are, are, are certainly indoctrinated and are using the cloak of uh, Islamic jihadism to present themselves as, as sort of millenarian warriors um, fighting against a corrupt state and, and um, but also trying to implement Sharia law. 
and driving uh, that narrative as a way to recruit more people into, into a sort of compelling movement um, on the ground. But actually, you know, when, when, when you look at the, the, the motivations of the local fighters, often uh, they may start to desert or want to leave if, they're not, if their payments are not coming in. Uh, so they are partly motivated also by, you know, the, the privileges that the gun and, and, and perhaps, you know, illicit finances or money, uh, recruitment money coming into their hands. Uh, that, that is a motivating factor. Now, as regards the foreign fighters, since 2017, it looks as if there has been sort of, uh, as I mentioned before, this, this watershed moment in, in, in Mozambique, but also actually in the, in the region, as it turns out. So I think I got to the point where we, we, we mentioned 2017, and that, that was a moment when the most uh, heaviest crackdowns occurred in Tanzania, when Tanzania was shutting down uh, various uh, Islamist networks and, and particularly uh, a, you know, a group of, of young men associated with many of them associated with actually the Al-Qaeda uh, franchises of the Swahili coast, uh, in turn connected to those in Kenya uh, through madrasa organizations and religious organizations that, that in turn had uh, a, a connection to Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Now, just to emphasize that that's all an Al-Qaeda strain of, 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 of radicalization that has, you know, that, that follows down from, from Somalia down the Swahili coast. But nonetheless, these young men were expelled from uh, or cracked down upon in Tanzania. Many of them drifted into Mozambique. They brought that ideology with them. They merged and fused with the, the, the Mozambican militants. And they have played a role of perhaps at times moving back into Tanzania, coming back and forth for different periods of the fighting. Now in the, in the, in the period of, um, of, 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 the, of the military operations, uh, some of these men have, have, uh, have, 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 are also sort of um, uh, playing a more transnational role. Now it, it's, through, it's through this sort of caucus of young men, Tanzanians, but also Kenyans, that ISIS is trying to right now drill into co-opt that, that network and bring it out of Al-Qaeda's camp into, into the ISIS camp, really through the dissemination of money. And there's a lot of money now being pumped through uh, uh, Kenya from financial cells in Kenya. And I believe the Kenyans have, have, have been doing, you know, making uh, some important investigations and even an important arrest in the last few weeks of, a, of an ISIS financial cell. Uh, that has been responsible not just for sending money into Tanzania and Mozambique, but also to Uganda and into Eastern DRC. And as it turns out, through new research that we are doing, um, that we're, we're starting to see uh, some of these Tanzanian men moving and being recruited since some time ago, actually since 2017 onwards also, in, and turning up in the camps in Eastern D Democratic Republic of Congo, with some of the same individuals also coming into Cabo Delgado. So there's a toing and froing of Swahili Coast boys that are participating in violent conflict in Cabo Delgado, but also in Eastern Congo. And you know, the culmination of this seems to be right now these terrorist threats or bomb plots that have been reported on in, in the public in, in Rwanda and Uganda, of course, Rwanda now being a, a part of the military uh, partnership, you know, the international military partnership with Mozambique to defeat Al-Shabaab. Bomb plots in, in Kampala and Kigali being unraveled and investigations there show that there are connections to the camps in Eastern Congo. New research that we're doing also sort of um, gives more credibility to reports of Mozambicans in the past who've been trained in these camps in Eastern Congo. So what are the implications of this? I, I think the policy here is that remains what we, what we highlighted in our report in June, which is you, you have to make a distinction between the Mozambicans and the foreigners uh, uh, and understand that the genesis of this crisis really is a Mozambican crisis with a foreign plug-in. Uh, and so you have to have a policy that deals with those two phenomena in different ways. Uh, the way that we deal with the Mozambicans, as, as we've reported in June, is to uh, offer them ways out, 
for surrender. You know, this has, has implications for the, perhaps the development of defector programs. If we know that these people are fighting sometimes for money, if you give them an opportunity elsewhere, maybe they will pull out. Now, now that the military operations have, have had some effect, uh, it is true that, that there's been some successes, of course, the, re the retaking of Mosimboy the prior, but those shouldn't be over-exaggerated because it's, it's well understood by the security forces participating in, in, in this exercise, this military exercise, that they have not defeated this group. It's far from being defeated. They pushed them into some extremities of the provinces. They put them on the back foot, that's for sure. They've taken back areas that, that we can now say are perhaps liberated between Palma and, and Mosimboy the Prior. There's some degree of, of, of traffic, normal traffic that is resuming. Uh, but it's, it's far from clear whether this movement is defeated. And if that is the case, then what we expect to see now, or certainly what I expect to see is pushed against the wall, with their backs against the wall right now, the insurgents are gonna to turn to that transnational network. And that transnational network, as, we, as, as I've described, with the implication of Tanzanians, with their connections to, to the training camps in Eastern Congo, uh, where, in, where direction is coming out in terms of the dissemination of how to blow up uh, improvised explosive devices, we're looking at a financial recruitment and IED proliferation network that is starting to uh, unfold in, in the region. So if, if the, the Mozambican insurgents do not have a way out, they may well turn to, this, uh, uh, to, to the more extreme factions, to the transnational networks, to seek assistance. And that will have implications for not just security on the battlefield, where the, 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 the international forces, both in, in terms of the, the force intervention brigade in Eastern Congo, which is basically a SADAC, a South, Southern African uh, plus Kenyan uh, military forces under blue helmets, and then obviously the Rwandans and the, and the SADAC forces in, 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 in Cabo Delgado, they will then perhaps be faced with more asymmetric tactics on the ground, We've not seen IEDs start blowing up on the battlefield, but they've, they've attempted to make some poorly constructed versions of, of IEDs that, that for now, thankfully, have not had much impact. But looking at what's been unfolding in Kigali and Kampala in terms of attempts to actually detonate bombs in capital cities, you, you see now that the intent and the security alert has also gone up in Kenya, by the way, that, 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 that there is this blowback now coming back into, into the region. And, 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 the, and the Mozambican insurgency is, is part of that regional story. Uh, so policy-wise, just to reiterate, if, if you know, to, to answer your, also just to reflect on your point about characterizing all of this as terrorism as well. Now, if, if um, uh, international policymakers only look at this from a battlefield perspective and say, they're terrorists on the ground in Mozambique and also in, in the camps now affiliated with ISIS in Eastern Congo, let's go and kill them. You have this militarized solution. I mean, that, this is what we want to try and uh, avoid where the, the, the only tool that is being used is, is, is military force. Because even Mozambican officials have admitted to me back in, in March, April this year, that they know that they will never defeat this movement. It is a grassroots, it comes out of the communities. So there has to be some, some resolution dialogue that, that takes place in the end to take away the, 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 the youth, reverse, the, 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 reverse the, 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 the flow of recruitment of the youth into the hands of Al-Shabaab and towards the state so that they then don't present themselves as an opportunity for the transnational jihadis to, to, to plug in. And the solution for the transnational jihadis is is more to do with law enforcement cooperation, intelligence cooperation, judicial cooperation, to make the kinds of interdictions and arrests that really need to, to start happening. As, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, you, you all know that, that Uganda and Rwanda, for example, it, it, it's well known and it's been written about in public, do not have their inner political difficulties at the moment, and there isn't the kind of cooperation that they may well have had in the past. Uh, but those sorts of trends also impact the relationships of very many governments in the region in terms of sharing information and, and using actionable information collected in one jurisdiction to interdict 
uh, those who may be receiving money, for example, from Kenya in, in Mozambique. And that work hasn't really got off the ground in, 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 in a very efficient way for, for now. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dino. Uh, terrific insights. I mean, this is a Mozambican uh, uh, affair. It's true that many of the uh, extremist leaders appear to be, you know, hardened uh, violent extremists. But so, but while the as 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 you mentioned, and again, it's in your report, the brains of the group uh, include uh, outsiders or foreigners. The the muscle is, is primarily Mozambican. So the group and uh, rank and file are, are still locals. Uh, you know, these are mainly, as, as, as you stated, poor fishermen, frustrated petty traders, uh, you know, uh, former farmers, unemployed youth. Uh, and some of them may have become obviously committed violent extremists or jihadists, as you put it in your report, but the majority of them still have locally based motives. So we have to make a distinction here between, you know, the Mozambicans rank and file and, 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 and those transnational. Uh, you know, militant, uh, violent extremists. So there are connections, as you said, and I was a beacon strained in Congo, uh, but, but we have to, it is a Mozambican affair and we have to draw distinctions so that we can, can deal with, with, with the issue. Uh, excellent. Uh, when we see that Jasmine uh, joined us, uh, I'll go to you. Um, and uh, Adriano started talking about political, you know, e e economy and, and how the insurgency in other Mozambique is linked, you know, to marginalization, but also to this large and dynamic illicit uh, economy. So the question is, if you can address it and, and briefly, please, you know, how has the political economy in the region exacerbated or fueled, you know, the grievances and how has the illicit economy uh, compounded the community grievances and, and generated the conditions for this group to emerge? So if you can, if you can do it in five minutes, uh, I would appreciate it. In terms of the time allocated, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, I think um, in terms of the question being raised, uh, um, we must understand that we are talking about um, an area that is vast in resources. Um, and um, it has been, if we go back into history and you look at the history of mining in that area, uh, providing a lifeline it was quite clear, and it is quite clear that these vast draws, resources played a very significant role in the evolution uh, or the up, build up to what has happened in 2017, especially when the government decided to intervene with um, mining and therefore taking the opportunity away from locals, uh, which just added fuel to fire. But then of course, organized crime in that region must be understood for what it is. It's institutional, we're talking fourth, third, fourth, and even fifth generation historical roots within Cabo Delgado. It has become a professional career, if I might say it like that. It is um, one way it is self-entitlement due to this institutionalization of organized crime. And that has presented also opportunities for many of the, of the people of Cabo Delgado as a way and a means of life. And we cannot ignore that. I just would like to apply caution. There is some serious wild cards being thrown on the table between the drug syndicates and the insurgents, and it's not as clear cut as it seems, but that's not what I'm talking about. The LNG sector. Now, when I go back to Anagarku, uh, the insurgents have not as yet targeted LNG sites. Has the LNG sector and the way they have been expanded in Cabo Delgado played a significant push or even pull factor? Without a shadow of doubt, the manner in which it was done, the manner in which the locals were deprived of their land, the manner in which promises were made to them that did not appeal to them and were not according to the expectations, most definitely accelerated the insurgency. Though I think we have to take care in seeing the LNG sector as one of the causes of the insurgency. My humble point of view is irrespective of the LNG sector, what we are seeing in Cabo Delgado would have taken place. It may have taken much longer to where we are today, but quite clearly, the LNG sector has not lived up to expectations. The manner in which the people and the forgotten Cabo Delgado gained just further 
opposition from locals in terms of um, what people expected in terms of employment, immediate benefits, and also, uh, sadly, where you had Western companies with Western ideas of development um, not being applicable to the expectations of the local people of Cabo Delgado, created immense um, schisms within um, Cabo Delgado. And that resulted and played a significant role in the frustration we are seeing at play. But added to that, and I think this we can, and we cannot make a distinction is what has happened since then is that we are seeing a a policy or an objective of creating as quickly as possible a security corridor around the lng sites and i'm specifically moving up to palma um, where we are seeing that rwanda is being deployed quite clearly the end objective is one of the security corridor and that then, and up until today, we are seeing frustrations with this exclusive type of policy intervention or counterinsurgency intervention. And at who? Who is going to benefit at the end of the day of such a corridor? Who is going to control it? And who's going to make the money out of this? Yet again, the forgotten Cabo Delgado, irrespective of its vast resources, irrespective what we have should come to realize by now is to listen to the locals and what the expectations are, are sadly being ignored. And so I have not heard what the other presenters have said, so mind me if I repeat. So the LNG sites, yes, they might have escaped being targeted, but that they are playing an, a tremendous or a highly intensified role in the psyche of the locals cannot be ignored. And with that, how officials in Maputo will respond and deal with this matter. There are currently indications that officials are not as satisfied with Rwanda out of Maputo. Um, and one can most likely attribute it, and I, um, I do not have clear-cut evidence, but one can imagine if one looks at the history of Cabo Delgado and the financial resources that just nearly drifted down to the southern part uh, into Maputo, being involved in certain organized crime activities for self-enrichment, will again start showing its face. Officials have been cut off their lifelines, the um, economic and financial benefits. And the longer Rwanda stays there, the longer these sites are being secured, and the longer organized crime syndicates are struggling to reestablish and refunction, as we have seen in the history of Mozambique, it will create not only tensions between the locals and the uh, forces, but also at an official level and a diplomatic level that will have economic implications. I don't want to go into too much detail about this one, but what I want to say is the following. Um, Dino has referred to the issue of um, what can be done about the insurgents and how to deal with it. The problem, I think, at the end of the day is if we start talking development, if we are start talking about the expectations of people, the LNG companies must start listening to the voices of the locals. They need to understand that a road that putting on switching on the lights does not entail and bringing back human dignity. And that is central to the issue of the forgotten Cabo del Cardo. Uh, there needs to be economic interventions, no one is arguing. There needs to be stability interventions, no one is arguing. But if we want to talk about addressing the root causes, it is not going to be overnight. It's a generational problem that has not benefited from the economic resources and what a state should have provided. And herein lies the heart of the insurgency. And hence, um, with all due respect, I think the distinction between foreigners and between locals in a county insurgency is a complete oversimplification of, of how we should view and how we should counter the insurgency. But if one looks at the youth, how they have started joining in Mosambuada prior. During the time it was in control of the insurgents, clearly, clearly the forgotten Cabo Delgado, the neglect and the limited opportunities available, has to start at its lowest, lowest level, the foundational level, 
where the people of Kabul Galkari starts trusting the government again, starts trusting officials again and the security forces. If that issue is not going to be addressed in terms of the economic framework, I can promise you, sir, we can give them all work. We can give both the most beautiful clinics. That divide will create a generational and a long-standing insurgency in Kabul del Gadu. And this is my concern today, and this is my last comment. We are being driven away, and we are hearing statements about leaders being killed, a military basis, which was actually nothing than overnight for most of these insurgents, um, being taken. And Rwanda stating, Mosambu Adapraya has been retaken. It just takes one bullet. It just takes one attack, as we have seen in Palma at the beginning of October, to counter and destroy the credibility of these counter forces. We need to take care and how we can integrate these successes, socioeconomic development and human dignity to be able to effectively drown the voice that drives the insurgents. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Jasmine, again. You know, key insights there. I've had to listen to the locals, uh, have to restore trust between locals and, and government. Uh, this is a generational uh, uh, problem, uh, uh, obviously. But th thank you. I'll go to uh, um, Adriano, Mr. Adriano. So, how does the local community then, uh, you know, first see this group, right? Uh, Shabab, as it is referred to locally, and, and how does the community respond? And why do youth you know, still join uh, uh, this group? As I've said um, in my earlier uh, intervention, uh, if you look at the patterns of some of the attacks, um, reports in the ground from the people uh, within the army, they would say that most of the attacks um, mainly in um, Mosimbo da Praia and Palma. They were from within. So they were attacking from within to, um, uh, towards uh, where the uh, Mozambique Defense Forces are. These, for those who understand the geography, um, they would say, it clearly falls within the pattern that I have talked about, um, which is um, the um, ethnicity aspect. And the government responds to this. Um, it hasn't been good in terms of first narrative, blaming sort of narrative, saying that uh, this group is allowing uh, violent extremists to uh, penetrate local communities, to mingle with local communities and to perpetrate attacks from within, making it difficult for um, Mozambique Defense Forces to adequately um, repeal and respond to it. So um, there is a, a relative, um, cleavage that is being used by uh, the violent extremist organization to penetrate um, uh, local uh, communities and to orchestrate attacks from within. This was clear in Mosimbo da Praia. This was clear, um, was clear in, um, um, in Palma. Um, and the, the response uh, to government, uh, military response, um, and also how government forces uh, dealt with the rescuing of civilians, um, those who were um, in the trapped areas, um, including those who um, uh, were um, running um, when the forestry, people seem to have perceived that government forces um, were more concerned in saving the lives of foreigners. And, and this has given some leverage 
or violent extremist organization to say, listen, we are here for you. Um, government forces, as you can see, um, uh, they are not there for you. And um, uh, next to it, how government has responded um, in terms of, um, in relation to those who were trying to flee and to present themselves to the authorities um, as being victims um, at the policy level, not good. The government responded with suspicions, suspicious towards um, uh, those locals. And, um, and, the, and the overall narrative um, and some of the footages that we have seen, um, um, I recall a, a shocking video really a shocking video. Each and every time it comes to my mind, you go in tears. That woman uh, in Musimwa da Praia, um, she was executed. She was naked. Can you imagine a woman of the age of my mother um, to be executed with 36 uh, bullets? Um, and she was, her cloth was taken off this is Africa, we, we, you don't do that. And, and so this, it has sparked um, um, uh, suspicious vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, authorities um, and, and also disbelief. Um, I'm not saying that uh, the local communities believe the more violent extremists, but it has created distance in relation to um, uh, 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 government defense forces as they were seen um, uh, by locals and, and um, um, uh, human rights organizations as um, committing and um, uh, um, uh, violating human rights, uh, not only in terms of overall negation of right to development, but really um, brutality and atrocities. And, 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 and let us also uh, go back um, how government initially responded using uh, private military groups uh, that they have not always been behaving well. So uh, uh, this has created um, and has to some extent contributed into um, violent extremists having a constituency. Um, and, 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 and also how the IT, IDPs, uh, they were treated um, you, you, you go to the camps now, uh, IDPs, they want to return to their uh, ancestral lands. It's not because it is safe out there. It's because they don't feel well treated where they are um, and, and uh, with the response uh, from government not adequate. Um, and, and the narrative, um, uh, there is growing change in terms of, you look at the the governor of Capital Guard, he's responding very well, um, not only in terms of attitude, but also in terms of narrative, but overall, um, uh, there is um, uh, militarization. And this uh, has given local communities uh, a, a sense that, um, uh, um, I wouldn't say close, but um, uh, you would see uh, some links. And those links, um, they have been used uh, for uh, recruitment. And clearly, because um, you don't see a significant change in the way that government is behaving in relation to human rights, in relation to dialogue, but more importantly, in relation to whether the avenues are being uh, put in place for those who want to uh, run away uh, for those who want to uh, present themselves uh, to be welcomed, to be treated uh, very well. So they are looked at with suspicions. And this, um, uh, it has further radicalized um, uh, young people um, to the point that um, until um, the uh, deployment of the Rwandese and Sadiq forces, um, there were indications that recruitment um, was taking place. And now um, uh, there is this military intervention. Um, uh, they, they, there is this triumphalistic um, um, 
discourse that um, they have um, uh, defeated uh, them. Not clear really what is happening at the moment. Research is needed um, uh, to see uh, what is happening uh, with uh, the violent extremists who are uh, fighting. The indications that uh, the key leaders they might have fled um, uh, to other countries, but where are those who are, who are fighting? One, two, um, is it really true that um, young people um, are not um, um, uh, further radicalizing uh, or the youth are not being recruited? Um, I have to say that um, uh, the, the, the RDF and, and SADC, um, particularly RDF because of its um, uh, Swahili uh, language um, um, and also um, their, their, their training, etc. Um, they seem to be moving closer to um, hearts and minds uh, of local communities, but we, we are still waiting to see uh, change vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, defense forces um, on how they treat local communities. And that might stop because at the moment, um, we haven't uh, really seen that. And the, the, the fear we have is that a government might be falling into that narrative that um, uh, they, have, they have repealed them uh, and that is safe. And they would be easily moving into the business as usual of um, wanting to have the private sector back um, without really uh, addressing the fundamentals. And the fundamentals, as Jasmine uh, uh, was reiterating uh, about dialogue, uh, an inclusive dialogue, which would pave the way, uh, not only for uh, the uh, aspects of political economy to be addressed, which are out there. I, I talked about instrumentalization by uh, powerful people. That is out there. That speaks to um, um, the, uh, the, the political economy. And that is, is there. It needs to be addressed. But also um, addressing the issue of uh, the local communities. Um, local communities are, are not being treated well. Um, you, you arrive in Pemba, you, 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 you feel the tension, um, and particularly what it comes to freedoms of the people. Um, uh, activists like us to have access to local communities. It is as if um, those uh, are not um, Mozambicans enjoying their full rights that you have to uh, answer questions as to why you want to talk to them. Uh, that is not good. This needs to be addressed and this um, uh, it is not stopping um, the feeling uh, uh, of the young people um, to be available for recruitment. Exactly. All right. Thank you, uh, Adriano. And now I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, uh, to our discussant, uh, uh, Idris. And just for our audience and participants, please, you can submit questions into the chat at any time. Uh, you know, while, while Idris is our discussant, to uh, provide his, his, his comments. So thank you. Um, over to you, Idris, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, thank you, Anwar. Honestly speaking, in terms of discussion, there isn't much to say. You have three brilliant panelists who I know personally. I had a pleasure of meeting Yasmin a few uh, months back when we were consulting from the African Union perspective. Uh, you remember the discussion we had with Fiona, Jasmine, and then Adriano, I, I spoke to him when I was last in Mozambique, and Dino, brilliant uh, uh, panelists. Uh, we, uh, we exchanged a few, uh, you, know, uh, th th you know, just recently. And I think they've painted a clear picture. Um, and I cannot help myself but draw parallels between what's happening in Mozambique and Mali and the Sahel in general. Let's just speak about Mali. And uh, you know, the last time I was in Mozambique, I was just telling the officials and Adriano himself, and I said, well, you, you know, it feels like a you know, the same dynamics that we saw in Mali we're seeing in Mozambique. And I hope, just cross my fingers, that we don't end up like uh, having a rerun of, of, of Mali mistakes or the mistakes that we did in Mali with this hard security approach to the issue and a, a, a small problem which is much more linked to development like uh, you know was presented by Jasmine uh, issues that will take quite some time. Uh, these are maybe, uh, you know, a policy, I wouldn't say a policy, but some bad decisions that were taken at the capital, which backfired. You know, if you don't develop certain parts of your country, 
then it will come down and haunt you at some point or another. And I think what happened in Mali is now happening in Mozambique, where, you know, for some political reasons, you will alienate and marginalize sections of your community who they are left on their own. If you don't have a school since 2006, you only have a high school, then why do you wonder and, 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 and are amazed that these guys or people are going to madrasas? They will go to whatever, uh, you know, uh, shed or, uh, or hut that, was, uh, that provides education to them. In terms of business and, 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 and providing for their families, illegal uh, and illicit business is what makes these people live. You know, unfortunately, we're still looking at many in many of our countries at the, you know, the bottom uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs, basic, you know, education, health, um, and, uh, and access to basic services. And, and this is where we're failing. And, uh, and I do agree with all panelists that this hard military security approach is not the only solution. I would caution against these uh, quickly, I would say, uh, overstated claims of victory. Uh, there is no victory against an enemy that is, uh, you know, looks, looks <laughs> and, and functions on the long term. We've seen it with the Taliban. We're, we're going to see it again with many of the terrorist groups here. You know, we might punch them and, and, and batter them, but they're here. For me, I always see it as being a, a strategic retreat. Uh, they're, they're hiding in the forest, but they're going back into their own communities because they are serving the purpose and the grievances, or at least giving the indication that they are responding to the grievances of local communities. So the protection is within the communities themselves. We cannot uh, really think that victory has been claimed. Uh, you know, from the Rwandan forces or Samim. Uh, Samim or, you know, the, the outfit itself, I don't know if it's fit for purpose, at least from this point of view, because we're talking about peacekeeping operations. We have to acquire peace before we keep it. That's one issue. Second, there is an issue of financing. Uh, so the finances of, of Samim, who is going to finance it? And um, I think it will last for six months. We claim victory, they'll pack and leave. The Rwandese will pack and leave and the Mozambicans themselves will find themselves in another much more difficult situation to, uh, to manage because they're only looking at it from a military defense security perspective. I think what needs to be done now is once we clear, we need to reestablish state presence, number one. That's very important. Uh, we need to also try to build that trust and rapport. And I don't know, I haven't seen, uh, I don't know who has a magic wand to ensure that within a fortnight, you know, we can build the trust between the security services, the state, and the populations they serve. I know I've been reading a report this morning that the Mozambican Defense and Security Forces are trying to recruit within the IDPs uh, in order to uh, ensure there is representation. Um, and I think there were about 5,000 individuals that have expressed to join the military forces and security forces in order to have, you know, this ethnic, I would say, um, representation within the defense and security services and to ensure that whoever is serving in the northern part of Mozambique does understand the culture but also the language and the local dynamics and it's quite important. Uh, from the point of view of dialogue, I think you know, Mozambique could, could, could do with a, a national dialogue uh, provided that this dialogue is uh, comprehensive, inclusive, and representative. Uh, we, we don't want, you know, the old, uh, I would say, guard coming back again because they're free limo or whatever Ever, you know, trying to push their political agenda. We want to make sure that the dialogue does include the locals, represent the locals, and then present the grievances of the locals as communities, but necessar not necessarily as individuals. Otherwise, if we're having individuals that come to speak on the behalf of their own benefit, we're not making any progress. On the contrary, we're just delaying a, a, a bomb that will explode sooner or later, not only within Mozambique, but I think within the, uh, you know, the region itself. The international dynamics of the threat, but also of the solutions are not to be disregarded. And I think here there is so much work to be done within the region itself, but also by uh, you know, institutions such as the African Union and, and also uh, the uh, international community as a whole. So I think, I hope I did not exhaust my seven minutes. I would have loved to talk more but you know three panelists very very brilliant presentations and i'm very grateful you know for this opportunity that was provided by ss to uh, acss sorry to uh, to group us all together and let us you know think and and and, and try to find proper solutions um, and, and guide and share the lessons learned from elsewhere on the continent so that mozambique uh, and mozambican policymakers do not make the same mistakes that we are seeing Unfortunately, I'm still suffering from uh, in other parts of the Thank continent. Thank you, Idris. Uh, again, excellent uh, uh, insights and comments on, on what we discussed. Uh, 
uh, so far. We don't have uh, much time left, uh, so we will move quickly into the Q&A session. And I have here uh, uh, several questions uh, that I will read to the uh, panelists, and then I'll, I'll call on each uh, one of you and, and please to be um, uh, concise uh, in, in addressing them in uh, you know, two minutes uh, max each. And again, I apologize for the time. Uh, crunch. So several questions here. Uh, first one is how were the origins of the crisis identified and what concrete measures have been taken for the benefit of Mozambican youth? Could you please discuss evidence you have seen of children being recruited and used as soldiers by the group? Uh, why is there a general feeling that the RDF is not going to succeed in its quest to bring long lasting peace to Capo Delgado? Um, another question is, with the tension between the so-called Islamic State and uh, the Qaeda among the, the terrorist leaders, how might this be used in the CT offensive to divide them from each other and from the many local issues and recruitment? And this one is for Adriano, is why has democracy not made it possible to end the marginalization of certain communities? Uh, and what are the real reasons for this marginalization? So obviously, this has been discussed. And another question is about, you know, the effects of this military intervention. Um, and, uh, uh, and the last one is, uh, you know, we have to, what you got, you know, what, what you addressed is, is uh, there are some general concerns about what trigger violent extremism and shouldn't we focus on the social issues instead of going full throttle uh, militarily. So there are many, many other questions, but I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop here and I will uh, go to, uh, to Dino. Um, on the issue of what, what has been provided to the youth, I mean, there, is, there are development plans that are now coming out of the, the Mozambican ministries, uh, backed by hundreds of millions of dollars of, of donor funds channeled through the World Bank. Uh, so that the, 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 there are the resources there. The, 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 the question is whether those resources are going to be channeled in in a way that, that, that actually addresses not just development issues, but also de, you know, developing, uh, the, 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 the developing the basis of, of, uh, of local economies in a conflict situation. And there's, a, there's a distinction between that. And therefore that development money ought, ought to be twinned with initially in, you know, in ways that, 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 that can be used to rebuild confidence with the population to also use uh, uh, or, or to, 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 to interact with um, uh, young men who come out of the um, out of the insurgency as a way to to reverse the flow of recruitment. Use these young men not just as defectors but also as ways to communicate back to others in the insurgency and to, to effectively have a, a you know a, 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 uh, uh, an effective DDR program. Uh, and that means that, that the government plans really also need to be consulted with local population and engaging with local civil society structures uh, uh, that, that work around local government structures so that there is a, a real sort of social dialogue between, between the state and, and the people as, uh, as this development is channeled in. Otherwise, it stands to be uh, are, are misunderstood again by the population as, or understood by the population as patronage money running into the hands of, of local, uh, um, uh, uh, local economic actors who, who will benefit and not the population itself. On the question of, just very quickly, on the question of, of, of Rwandan intervention, speaking to the Rwandan authorities, they, I mean, they, their, their, their vision of this looks to be something that might be there for the long term. Uh, well, I, I would caution that actually, but, but beyond the short term, I would say that they have a, a vision that, that looks to not just counterterrorism operations, which, which is what they pursued at the very beginning of, of this uh, military intervention, but then shift towards peace building. The problem with that is that unless there's of course a national strategy at the same time that 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 treats these you know these root causes of the conflict and these local grievances then we may feel we may see international intervention sort of sliding into a forever war in in this part of the world and it you know we we mentioned in 
it's it's not the it's not the strictly the most um, a comparable example, but it's still a pretty good example. We mentioned in our report in June the uh, experience of SADC troops under blue helmets in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, where eight years ago the massacres of the Allied Democratic Forces started, and today we're seeing that armed group also affiliated to ISIS spreading north of North Kivu into Ituri and actually uh, rendering that military intervention. Um, pretty pretty toothless in the end. And so while they may be able to to claim, you know, victories along the way, uh, battle, you know, victories and battles, they're losing the war. Uh, and that is something that is that 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 the that that this international military intervention sure. risks uh, uh, experiencing unless there are these these root causes uh, uh, treated. Thank you, Dino, and I see that uh, Idris have, have, have to leave us. So thank you so much, uh, Idris, for your, for your insights. Much appreciated. I'll go to Jasmine, and again, please be, be brief. Thank you so much. And, and you know, thank you for ending with the forever war scenario. Highly depressing. I, I will focus uh, quickly on um, where we stand with, with the foreign forces in Cabo Delgado. Um, and um, the level of coordination. And then I would also like briefly look at the child soldiers that has been raised and then the AQ ISIS um, question related. Uh, Professor, nice to see you on the panel again. It's the only time we meet, but hopefully we'll meet again. Um, what is happening on boots on the ground in Cabo del Tartu? I am briefly, and I don't have time, there is currently no trust between the Rwanda forces and Samim. Tensions are building up between Rwandan forces and Mozambican government forces. The reason for that is an old problem, that of information being leaked to insurgents according to Rwandans. Hence, they do not want to cooperate and they do not want to fight with Mozambican uh, Defense Force soldiers on their side because of the precise execution of ambushes when joint operations was launched. Um, and then the issue I referred to earlier on, sir, uh, in terms of also slowly building up tensions from our Kutu side, that um, what Rwanda is doing now, what they expected from Rwanda is exactly not the same as they expected the clearance operation to pull out, which would have allowed them to continue with the activity. So what I'm trying to say, and I'm skipping a lot of detail here, it's not the purpose of this panel discussion. There are serious tensions in Cabo Delgado, and Dino referred to the forever war. It always starts at the, the diplomatic level, and how this matter will play out at the diplomatic level. Some um, will not easily withdraw for as long as Rwanda is present. There is a Cold War situation, and it's maybe a bit exaggerating, but you get my message. Um, the whole issue of Rwanda wanting to be the whole and the gladiator of uh, Southern Africa, bringing peace, some him saying, Sadek saying, no, we will take care of our problems. That must be seen against the background of years of diplomatic tensions between, for instance, South Africa and Rwanda. And then, of course, um, the whole issue of Iraqification with France. I know there's a lot of debate on who's paying the bill and who's footing the bill. Um, I'll reserve comments on that. But what is clear is that the militarization in itself is fragmented, is playing out in Cabo Delgado. And that is going to result in standing deployments for other objectives than merely defeating the insurgency. And that is my concern, you know, in terms of the issue that you raised on a forever war. That yes, we might see a forever presence, but for completely different reasons. And yet again, the people of Cabo Delgado will lose out as they don't become centrifugal to this process. I move on. Child soldiers, I'll quickly run through this one. I said in an interview with Muslim World of Pride was the biggest mistake ever made by government. And indeed, if you start talking about child soldiers, we have to ask ourselves, what is a child soldier? When is a boy a mature adult according to Makonde? to Moani, and we have to understand and respect their traditions and when they are being defined as such. But what is clear is whilst in Mosambuada prior, women and children were provided, or young girls and young boys 
were provided with extensive training, extensive security checks, and uh, I mean security checks, is watching them, seeing, seeing who they can rely on, and from their training took place. Now, this training that did happen at Muslim Water prior was most definitely not how to hold the peace, but how to kill and how to make war. Yes, um, yes if you could ask me, do I have a photo or a video? No, I do not have. But surely it doesn't take much to see that he, these young children has already started with an identification right the Lord Resistance Army, where violence has become the way of life. And they will not be shy in terms of being used and even demonstrate their power. And this is my concern. It becomes a generational culture sitting in, and that has to be broken. On Al Qaeda and the Islamic State, shortly, I do not foresee for the media the future we will have an Al Qaeda Islamic State um, <coughs> divide in Cabo Delgado. What I though foresee is as the Islamic State narrative starts finding a greater foundational footprint or institutional footprint, there could be tensions building up within the insurgents like we have seen with Boko Haram and Islamic State West Africa that has then led to internal uh, competition. But for now, this remains still absent with a little access I have. I have no evidence that there are tensions, that there are different groups. Um, the insurgents are clearly set now on withdrawal, lie low, where they are. I wish I could answer that question. Um, but it's clear that the extremist narrative is going to have a big problem in finding in a region the mass support, for instance, what they have in uh, Lake Charles, Mali. But the longer it lasts on, the, lo uh, the greater the opportunity yes, for that. So. Sorry, I'm rushing through it. Few ideas quickly, sir, but in a nutshell, if you can call that a nutshell, I don't know. That's because... so much, much appreciated. Thank you. Very, very <laughs> insightful again. So I'll go the, the last, uh, Adriano, please be very, very brief, uh, two minutes max, please. No, thank you very much. Uh, the question to me was um, why democracy um, is, um, is related to um, the problem we're discussing today. It's simple. Mozambique's um, um, democracy it is not inclusive. It excludes significant part of the population, including the young people, particularly from meaningful participation. Mozambique's election are fraudulent. In the last election, it was almost a no election with the killing of human rights defenders. Uh, when fraud, electoral fraud, uh, let me put it this way, where, where you have uh, election capture and democracy capture, and the young people see no meaningful mechanisms for participation in governance, in democracy, uh, and there is blatant violation of human rights, um, you create an overall um, uh, socio-economic um, uh, and political environment for uh, violent extremism um, to thrive. This is the reality in the context uh, of Mozambique. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, the Thank you for the, the participant. It was really a, a treat to have a, you know, uh, experts of, the, of this caliber. Uh, and I'm sure our participants uh, you know, have a, a lot to, to uh, take and to process and to, uh, to, to reflect, obviously, uh, uh, on. Uh, so just generally is what, what we got, and I don't have time, obviously, to, to sum it up, is that Mozambique, you know, violent extremists have been motivated by grievances against the state that they see delivering very little for them. And at the root of the conflict is, uh, you know, is, 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 is a governance uh, problem. So to stabilize, obviously, in other Mozambique would require a, um, you know, a citizen-centric uh, uh, strategy uh, that tackles, obviously, the security, uh, but the political, the economic, the social aspects of the, of, uh, of the, of the insurgency. So th thank you again for, uh, uh, for our expert uh, panelists, thank you for our participants that uh, that have joined us. So uh, be safe and and be well. Thank you.
for the next time.